Super excited to be here. I haven't done one of these uh, since pre-COVID, like with you know, some like excited, I'm um, gonna look for some participation. Um, today, my goal is to tell you a little bit about my story and the story of the Chebo as we built an awesome business. And hopefully I'm gonna inspire somebody to building great things. Before I overwhelm you with a lot of corporate SaaS things, I'm gonna tell you a few things about myself, if that's okay, um, that resonate with me as far as I, I, I operate. These are things that not everybody knows. I haven't shared them, most of this before, and so here you go. Age 18, my first job, I was um, really excited about starting this rock venue that didn't exist in the hometown where I lived. I'm originally from Italy. That's a spaghetti accent that you hear today. And um, I was really excited about the fact that we were going to build a rock club, but it didn't exist. So we prepaid a venue. Um, for about 10 openings, and for the first nine openings, nobody showed up because nobody understood what it was. A lot of people came to the club, and they were looking for something different than what we were marketing. Eventually, we were able to turn it around, um, and um, we hired a very popular underground rock band called Yamichi di Roland. I mean, if any of you in the audience know that, that's amazing. I don't think you would. And, um, and on that day, um, I got a phone call at 7 p.m. from friends at the club um, saying, hey, um, there's police, there's, there's the fire marshals, the road's blocked, downtown Genova, which is where I'm from, was just uh, blocked. The reason was we had, um, you know, we had so many people out of the club that blocked the entire street in downtown. It was awesome. We blocked the entire city. From that day and on, um, the club developed the DNA. Um, we built a story of like seven years. I haven't done it that, for that long, but um, what that taught me was that from an operating principle standpoint, don't give up. Product market fit is really hard. Category creation is really hard. And when you, when you um, um, are into it, then eventually there's going to be something that can turn it around. Um, second operating principle that I learned from this story, I bet most of us shared the story in this room, is go long. Um, probably you all have a story of having done some early days job for not a lot of money. I know I have. Um, and so, you know, I was commuting between Genova and Milano, um, every day, two hours go, two hours come back. I was spending about five and a half hours commuting for 250 bucks a month. Um, the reason why I was doing that, I, need, I needed to gain experience, I love tech, but there was no tech in my city. I didn't have money to afford moving. So that's what I did. I played a long game. I thought that that was gonna teach me something that I was gonna reuse. And I bring that operating principle of go long, have a vision, um, follow your purpose, eventually leads to money later on. Third point, pick up the phone. I had bounded my way through every single tech job I've ever had. I wasn't fancy ever, neither am now, and I never got inbounded. So I always reached out to those that I had an interest for, from the first one through the last one. True story, I outbounded in LinkedIn our CEO and founder, Claudio Herba, and said, hey, I'm in the space, you're in the space, let's talk. He said, go away, your competition. And, um, but you know, his rejection was awesome and uh, led us to where we are today. So I like those stories because they're personal, they're about me, they're not about business, but they really resonate with a lot of the things that I really believe in. And um, one thing that those in my circle of love know about me is that I absolutely love cooking. That's what I do all the time, uh, you know. Spaghetti accent, Italian, pasta. And that's my son, Leo. Him and I, every weekend, go at it together. And why am I telling you about this? Because in the story of the Chebo, 
the recipe of the company has been in the making for about 18 years. Great things um, take time. It all started, frankly, as a bowl of spaghetti. Um, the company, the Shebo, first started as spaghetti learning. Now, I cannot take credit for that beautiful brand name because I wasn't there back then. Um, however, it was at that time uh, um, our, our founder, Claudio, who came up with it. And fortunately, somebody told him that it was not a great idea and it moved on. Um, but like I was saying, great things come with time. And um, together, we built an awesome business. Today, I'm about to tell you a little bit more about it. And uh, here it is. The Chebu is a, for those of you that are not familiar with our company, it's a learning management platform, B2B, uh, focused on enterprises. Um, today, it's at about $170 million in ARR. Um, publicly listed in NASDAQ and TSX since 2019 for TSX and 2020 for NASDAQ. Um, about 800 employees. The business was founded in, in Italy. I'll tell you a little bit about that story in just a minute. Um, but one of the things that we're really proud of that I get a lot of questions about, that I get a chance to talk about, especially in this current um, economic environment is having built a business that, is, that sits on a foundation of, of real um, sustainability. And um, we, we got to about where we are today, 170 million, effectively burning $7 million, which um, you know, has been the product of a um, shared belief that great things can happen without burning a lot of money. Um, what has contributed to this rapid growth at a reasonable cost um, has been um, a trend and a desire to continue growing up market. If you can see on this chart, what, what this is saying is if you look at the chart from 2016 through today, we grew our average customer, um, average, average ACV from about 10, 12K to the mid 40s. That was really one of the keys to accelerated growth, and that reflects our continued shift and go to market from VSB, SMB to mid market enterprises. The space that we operate in, our market, for those that are not intimate with it, is very large. It's very wide. In the US alone, it's about $8 billion. When you look at the market in two perspectives, one, the, the learning space as a uh, internal training, as you, so, you, so you'd say, versus external training, customer education, partner education, and so on. So it's a massive space that has allowed us to really master the art of um, understanding personas and uh, focusing on the problems to solve as opposed to building a monolithic large product uh, with, without a real focus on the problems we solve. And so when we think about our space, we don't think about it in, a, in the context of just our product, but the problems we solve. In our world, we address these personas. There's more than 10 personas that we target at any point, depending on the industry. And what's been beautiful and not so easy also to execute on is that our average customer adopts the Chebo across two, three, four use cases. Now, that's brilliant and awesome from an ACV unit economic standpoint, and also a little bit hard to execute from a marketing messaging uh, perspective because the customer education leader speaks a slightly different lingo than the L&D internal leader, as opposed to the compliance leader. But we understand that in the same corporation, we may have multiple buyers. So it's lear learning through how to market to different personas within the same organization, and the land and expand has been a journey that we've been on for a while. Um, 
the real beauty of, um, of learning and I, I believe of every story, of every ghost story is really in the journey of it. So I'm hoping in the next 30 or so minutes um, to take you through some key milestones that we went through, things that taught us a lot, and then following that, I'm gonna talk a little bit about takeaways and things that I would do uh, differently and whatnot. So first off, I was not part of the original founding team, but Cheba was, uh, um, was uh, founded by our CEO and founder, Claudio, alongside uh, our current CPO, Chief Product Officer, Fabio, out of a small town near Milano, closer to Monza, um, back in 2005. So a long time in the making, 18 years, as I would say. And um, in interestingly, it didn't start back then as a cloud company and or a SaaS company. It was um, a software that companies would install locally and would run under um, GPL uh, uh, license uh, open source. And that business ran effectively as a consulting business for the first seven years, acquiring customers through the community and uh, making money um, via the selling of professional services. Um, in 2012, uh, you know, I was very fortunate to meet with Claudio. Well, I outbounded him, as I was saying. And um, I had already been operating in the United States, although uh, I moved to the States as a young adult. And um, the goal was always, how do we take this company that is domestic market Italian that, does, that has this open source software and make it a global cloud company? That was the dream, the goal, the plan. And so, yeah, we set it up to do that. <laughs> um, and so we first, in order to accomplish it, we had to rewrite the entire code base, effectively. In, I joined in March 2012, the Chebu, and I remember that by the summer of that year, we had launched our first um, ASP and cloud-hosted version of the Chebu with a self-provisioning trial, um, an approach that in today's modern times would be a lot closer to um, uh, product-led. Product -led. We were, our thesis at that point was that organizations around um, anywhere between five and 500 employees were going to buy the Chebo using a credit card online. We were gonna optimize the flow of our trial and we were gonna set it up in a way that via inbound marketing and um, via channel, we would have a lot of buys online and we spent a ton of time optimizing our trial and making all that process seamless and adi, adi, adi. Um, We soon learned <laughs> that our thesis was perhaps not market validated. In other words, our product was not aligned with a VSB or even a very small customer. And while we were having traction and success in signing up customers, um, they were smaller companies effectively. Um, we kept on getting pulled up market very naturally in an inbound motion. The Chebo, in fact, um, generated its first, I wanna say 20, $30 million in ARR without ever having a single outbound individual in the company. In 13, there was the first transformational moment in our growth. Um, at this point, remember, the company is about 14, 15 people. And it's making money um, uh, only recently, as of a year, in our, on a recurring basis in, in SaaS. Um, because the goal was always to expand the business internationally, the question was, how are we going to do that? Where do we start from? And that dilemma of European entrepreneurs that try to cross the ocean, so to speak, and execute somewhere else, it's a dilemma in itself that could perhaps even um, necessitate its own session. Um, but I will simply say it's a big one, and the way we chose to go about it was financially driven also, based on the resources we had. We chose to go at it in an indirect manner, meaning 
building head down a channel infrastructure of partners that would allow us to penetrate certain markets that we didn't have finances or funds to go in directly. And that is how we ended up opening our first office of all places in the world in Athens, Georgia. Now imagine like a bunch of Italians that opened the first office in Athens, Georgia. Um, in fact, when I first said, you know, to our founder and CEO, Claudio, hey, let's open in Athens, he's like, Greece? I'm like, no, 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 we're not gonna, we're not gonna do Greece at this stage. <laughs> um, the way we executed that, I think it was an interesting play retrospectively. I would like to say that wisely that we, we had it all planned out and figured out, not really. Kind of the sauce came together a little bit, um, you know, with, with good intention. But the idea was we had a bar or a reseller in the region that we eventually pulled out the resources from. And once we already had traction in the market, we got the resources that were in the bar that I actually had, you know, facilitated for them to be in the bar. And when we were ready, we opened up, opened an office. And at this point, we already had employees that were trained on the technology, um, able to pre-sell, support, implement, and do the whole thing. And what we didn't have to do in that way was to go and hire a bunch of new people and train them and, and bring them up to speed and spend nine months ramping them, um, creating a, a cost hole, right? It was a hot swap, so to speak. And so it was very efficient. Um, and in fact, very early on, about a year later, thanks to this kind of accelerated path, to go to market, we were um, seeing the initial signs of um, uh, real, real appreciation and commercial traction. Um, our trial play was working pretty well in terms of traffic, um, but we noticed that our idea of selling to very small companies wasn't really paying off. The, the ticket was too, hot, too small. Um, the customers we were working with were um, very demanding uh, when it came to the relationship between cost and effort to sustain. And our product led itself to solving problems that were way more complex. So in, in a few words, we had a product complexity that was overwhelming for our buyers. And for that reason alone, we were pulled up by bigger companies that were looking at our product, except our brand uh, value was very low in the North American market. That's when another transformational moment in our story, when we were able to attract capital in Canada, um, of all places, thanks to Intercap, today still our largest uh, uh, um, uh, shareholder um, as a public company, and, and Class Capital. We invested a few million dollars in the Chebu in 2015 to accelerate and fuel international growth. Um, they came in at a great time, at a whopping $8 million or so valuation, good for them, um, and, um, and helped us you know, bridge the gap that we had in execution. I'd say in retrospect, that relationship was and remains one of the reasons why we've been able to succeed in, in the long run, because we just had a tremendous chemistry with our investors, because they were supportive and they um, were not, um, they, 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 were, they were supportive and they were not in our way. Um, 2016, right, just four years after our first SaaS customer, um, we win our first million plus um, customer. Big win against the top one uh, category player at that time. Um, retrospective. Uh, as I'll talk about later in the lessons learned, we didn't charge enough. Um, but jokes aside, what really uh, sticks with us about that experience is that we learned that a ton. We learned and we adapted and it forced a certain level of discipline that um, as you go up market, you will uh, need if, if you desire to continue going up market. Um, I was named CRO in 2016. That was, that, was, that was great. At that point, the title CRO wasn't really that popular, really. I looked at, I looked at people like Mark. I don't know if Mark Roberge is here in the room, but he was, he's been a mentor of mine, and, and you know, I love the guy, and 
And he was the CRO of HubSpot at that point, doing about $150 million in ARR, and thinking, oh my God, $150 million in ARR, that's crazy. I will never get there. And there you go, you know, a few years later, uh, we're past that. And so it was great. I moved my family in Canada from, um, from Atlanta, Athens area, to Toronto. My wife's from, from the south. She, the Canadian winters didn't really settle well with her for a while, but you know, it was fine. Um, and, then, and then more operationally speaking, for those of you that wonder, okay, but you know, how, what were you selling and what were the kind of key levers of success? Interestingly, again, it's 2017. I think the business is again in the 20s or 30s at this point. And, and we started building our outbound engine. Everything was in, inbound derived. Um, we built a pretty sophisticated inbound formula that was paying off a lot. And but we started hiring our first outbounders because we recognized that alongside the need um, to go up market, we needed more intentionality and more targeted efforts. And we also bootstrapped a business that is doing really well for us to this day. It's, it's material to our growth. It's called you know, OEM or white label, where certain companies would effectively buy our software, they would market it, they would sell it, they would implement it, they would support it, and you know, they, they would essentially use it as theirs under their brand name. And, and this is a very material business for us. Um, and then, hey, 2019 and 2020, real quick, we went public, wild, completely wild. Like we went wild at a point uh, in which the markets we we're gonna get um, pretty hard, we didn't know that. We were wondering, do we raise, do we not raise? And, and then we decided to go public in 19 in TSX. At this point, the company was about 40 million bucks US in ARR, so very early. Um, but retrospectively, it was the right call. And, and the whole going public thing um, is another chapter in itself that um, deserves um, um, you know, a few pages, but I will just say, the big thing is it teaches you a ton about business discipline and it forces certain behaviors that perhaps a company at that size at that time wouldn't, wouldn't um, um, pay attention to, I guess, because you don't have to, um, but the financial discipline and the operational discipline and the overall planning concept and thinking about investments become a lot more of a serious job because now you have an audience out there that is called shareholders. And, um, and so, you know, we, we were very blessed with that decision and it did really well for our company. Um, fast forward, we hit about $100 million in ARR uh, in 2021 and uh, made the two, actually three, um, acquisition of uh, VARs and, um, and technology companies across uh, Gen AI, and uh, learning community management uh, more recently. Um, and you know, the reason why I, I chose today to kind of walk you through things in a timeline, it's because it's really hard to tell the story of, um, of 12 years in the making um, in, in a manner um, that, is, um, uh, uh, that doesn't present some key facts and key transformational moments. But I would also say that there's, there, have be, there have been way more transformational moments in the company, and I, my focus has always been more on the revenue and upside, but there's been a lot of decisions on the product side that have been equally important in the journey to where we're today. Um, the way we think about the future in our space, uh, what we believe is gonna happen is there's gonna be a significant, uh, um, a significant impact of uh, AI technologies, of course, in, in the space. Uh, this is a space where content plays a huge role and the whole impact of gen AI technologies in the content generation are gonna be massive. So we've, we've um, invested in AI for the past six years with a dedicated team in our R&D labs in Italy and recently bought a company to do even more cool things there. So um, enough, I would say, of the of the um, uh, key facts. And I'd like to spend a few minutes now talking to you a little bit about, if I think back over it all, uh, what do I take away? So from a dollar zero recurring business 
in Italy to um, you know, a business that is added to $200 million in ARR globally with eight offices. I think, first of all, that going from a small entity in Europe to North American uh, market validation requires a very intentional playbook. Over time, I've spent a ton of time with European entrepreneurs, and I've heard horror stories of, um, of burning a ton of cash to trying to set up an entity and hiring people and hiring the wrong person and doing it all again, and four years later, I haven't gotten no traction yet. So I do think there are some ways to mitigate risks. Um, and um, um, I think we were very fortunate to take the path that we took. It was uh, quite coincidental. We had some advice, but um, I, would, I would do that again. It worked out really well for us. That is a channel first model. Um, this is one that I have um, a lot of uh, you know, heart into because uh, as, as we were doing this, I remember um, going through the conferences and talking to thought leaders and, and being told, hey, you know, once you pass you know, 10, you're going to need new people. Maybe you have to replace yourself. Well, once you pass 50, you know, same story. And I would say to those of you that are in that journey, um, that have those thoughts or the imposter syndrome, so to speak, it's like, oh, you know, we need somebody that has done it already. <sighs> to me, that's, that's a bunch of bull crap. I think, I think the real limit is within yourself. Um, you know, we gotta develop self-awareness, realize when, when it's enough, you know, is enough is enough. But if you feel the fire and if you see the road ahead, just keep on going. Um, and hopefully don't, don't, you know, don't run into a wall, but um, just keep on going. Yeah, the, the limit is only here and here. Um, for us, one of the most critical things up to date has been a cohesive leadership team. Cohesive not just from a cultural standpoint. Everybody talks about culture and how important it is. It absolutely is, right? forming the right culture and aligning on the, on the principles. But I think in the early days and really within the first um, three to four years of market fit and acceleration, you have to have a funding team that has competencies that are not overlapping. The reason why I really enjoy doing what I did, the reason why I worked really well with the management team is because we all had a specialty and nobody was in overlap with one another. Yeah, our, our CEO was always product vision five years out and a, a astute financial acumen but not commercially interested. Our CPO was a technologist with a real product management background. Um, and I brought to the table market knowledge in our space, um, internationalization capabilities, and, and, and sales uh, background. So when you combine all of that, you have a magic sauce. If you have folks that want to do the same thing, <laughs> um, in the beginning, I think it gets harder. That's, that was our experience. Um, this is a funny one. So, believe it or not, we actually have run the business up to about $80 million in ARR with not a single um, technology, from the go-to-market standpoint in particular, that was not built in-house. We built in-house a CRM, we built in-house a um, marketing automation tool, uh, we built in house an ERP. We built in house the provisioning systems of our trials and our customer installations. Now, you would think you're crazy. And I think, in retrospective, it is kind of crazy. Why would we ever do that? Um, well, the why, it's because we come from a real builder mindset. Some companies are more acquisitive, and some others build it all, and we certainly belong to the latter category. Um, but it really helped us accelerate in the early days. Think about, you know, Every time you want to implement a business and commercial process in your company, and the next question you have to ask yourself is, well, does Salesforce do that? Does HubSpot do that? Does Mercado allow me to do that? And the answer oftentimes is a sort of, you have to adapt yourself to the way it's done, but it slows you down. Whereas for us, it was a lot of like building <laughs> custom workflows that allowed the systems to look and feel in and operate in the, in the way we wanted. Now, would I do it again? Nah. I wouldn't. The pain that that caused later on in the, in the, 
in the uh, journey has been very high. Untangling the beast has been a full-time job of a few. So I would, I've learned a lot out of that experience. If you're building anything custom, just stop, please. Um, then, um, um, again, if this audience has folks that are building and that are in, on the journey, yeah, you know, this is obvious, but just spend a ton of time personal, personal developing. Identify two or three people that you really admire and go at it and steal all their secrets and, um, and just, you know, ask for time. And it's amazing how people that are really smart, that have done great things, they have in their heart to share back. Most of the times, not all, um, but most of the times they'll just open their arms and say, all right, how can I help you? And, and I feel like some people are too shy to ask for advice, perhaps. Um, data enrichment is a big topic. I don't know if, does anybody have a data problem in their company? <laughs> a few ends. I find, I find that when we, I talk to, you know, um, revenue leaders in particular, but really every SaaS company, data is always a, um, a sticky point. Everybody wants more data, better data. The data is clunky. Oh, you know, shit in, shit out, sorry. Um, <laughs> um, the reality is, Data is never gonna be perfect, especially early days. What's needed is your depth of knowledge in the business and layering it on. You can't just have scientific decisions made because you have perfect data. You always have to trust your God as well. Now, to this date, at the stage in which we are, we brought in a data team, we have an entire BI team, we have somebody that strategically thinks and, and structures data. It's actually sitting here in the audience. David, thank you for existing. I would be lost without you. But the reality is, earlier days, you got to live with it and make good decisions and also trust your God. Um, to the topic of frugality and running a business that is efficient, I'd say, you know, uh, Amazon, I think, publicly talks about one-door decisions versus two-door decisions. The one-door decisions being the ones that you, um, you know, um, once you take that door, there's no coming out of. And the two-door decision is you come in, that doesn't look good, you, you, you can exit um, from the other door. And that's just a metaphor for saying you have to recognize and find a way to establish what you're going to be doing and how expensive it's going to be and the risk tolerance you're going to have. Um, so test and experiment your thesis, hypothesis, ideas, whatever you want to do, don't, just don't go shebang. POC the hell out of it, pick one, measure it, does it work? Okay, do it more. And, and when it works, ruthlessly execute and just don't listen to anything else. Just do it and go at it. Um, running a public business, the implications you rarely hear about. Now, I gotta be careful what I say because it's a public business, so there's, <laughs> there's things that I can say. I would say um, that, um, well, IPOs have cooled down, right? Three, four years ago, everybody went to IPO. Now, IPOs in tech have slowed down to an extreme. Hopefully, we're going to see it more and more over the next couple of years. But the reality is there's pros and cons. And what, for me, was fascinating is there were things that nobody really spoke to me about. I didn't know when I went in the earnings calls, how freaking hard those are and the questions you get asked and how you have to prep for it to not sound like an idiot. That's a lot of work. And, um, and then the other part that I didn't know about is how much your internal comms have to change. You know, we used to be like, great quarter, 180%, we crush our goals, great job guys, we signed this customer. No, you can't do that, you go to jail. Right? You can't do that. You have to stop talking about your outcomes and results until those are known to the market, which usually happens a couple of months later. Um, and so it's tricky, right? Because, because now think about the fact that you really want to go to the company and say, oh, we signed customer X, which we pursued for two years, and it's a massive logo. Well, we can't say crap um, because that is considered a, a public material information. If you share that, you know, you're basically making the entire company um, insider subject. 
So there are a lot of things that people don't quite talk about, in my opinion, about the implications of going public. These are just two tactical things. Um, there are many others. Um, so it's not like, yeah, surely be careful what you wish for. For us, it's been an amazing journey. It has forced upon us a level of discipline and execution that we wouldn't uh, otherwise have accomplished and probably pursued. But you know, it comes uh, at a relatively um, high cost from the implementation standpoint. Um, and um, finally, I asked myself a lot, hey, if I were to be in a situation, sooner or later, would I have to do all of this again? What would I do and what would I not do? Knowing what I know, 12 years at it, what, what would I not do? Um, and so these are the lessons I learned. I used to think that profitability was the enemy. <laughs> I, I used to think, oh my God, really? Now I have to run a profitable company? I just want to grow. Just pump in money, keep CAC in control, bring up the top line. I was really wrong, right? Fortunately, um, our CEO was balancing me out and, uh, and we ran a really, really, really high efficient business. And CAC has always been something we, we spent a, a, ton of um, a ton of time monitoring and managing. But I would say really switching the mindset, going from profitability as the enemy to profitability as their fundamental ultimate goal. We build businesses to make money to those that invest in businesses, not to burn the money that people give us. If we kind of think about that in that way, I think it's, uh, it shifts the paradigm. It's very interesting, right? Like years ago, every single investor I spoke to used to say, all right, so if we gave you a lot more money, what would you do with it? And now the questions I get are, okay, what are the ways that we, we can increase profitability? So even the macro trends in the market change a little bit people's perspective. Um, the other one that I feel like it's really underlooked and underconsidered is thinking about pricing strategically. I know I haven't made this a priority for a really long time. I know that I didn't even understand what thinking about pricing strategically really meant. I thought it was like, oh, maybe we can price up and down and no, 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 no. There's an entire science around pricing. There are experts out there. Some charge a ton of money, some are reasonable. I would encourage you to talk to those that are reasonable and just pick their brain. And the amount of knowledge that they can provide to you is, um, is very vast. Now, Founders typically are like, I know my market, I know my SCP, I know the competition, la, 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 and you convince and persuade yourself that this is not a priority. My perspective, that is the wrong way of looking at it. You gotta challenge pricing um, no later than your 10, 15 million dollars ARR, and then go at it iteratively every so often. So, for example, for us, we brought a pricing expert in house recently. We recognized that the, the impact of it the needle moving of making the right decision was so high that we had to bring in-house somebody that is a professional at it. Um, I'm pretty customer obsessed and I would put more emphasis on it in the earlier days and the following point is kind of saying along the same lines, spending more time with customers. And I, I like this one a lot. You know, I feel like in the early days, we are, these big customers come to the table and say that they're interested and our immediate reaction was like, oh my God, big logo, all right, we gotta get them. And as a result, our immediate reaction to that is we get really um, uh, patient, is that the right word? Maybe um, not very aggressive about pricing, about that. I'd say charge them double. Create deep data education and better financial education and cross senior management. Management makes good decisions with data when they actually understand it. If they don't understand the underlying metrics, if you, if you can't have open, quick um, conversations about CAC, LTV to CAC, um, um, uh, churn, and all these things, and people don't grasp it, and you are, right? You, you've got to create a foundation of folks that understand the, the things so that the CEO can talk to a manager about something and there's shared belief and understanding. But if the glossary isn't shared, like stuff breaks and as you scale the company, 
people are not on the same page because you don't understand where people are coming from. And I would personally spend more time doing data education and financial education um, way earlier on than we did. Um, leadership, talent acquisition, talent retention, super big topic. Also, that could deserve a 30 minutes alone. But I would say rule of thumb, when it gets big, every new leader that you inject, you get to find your own avenue of selection that matches your company culture. Um, but I would say the one leader that you install later on in C, in you know, VP and above, if you get it right, it's amazing what it can do. If you get it wrong, it's amazing how it holds you back for a long time. So implement the right processes so that you have a lot of conviction going into it as opposed to, oh my gosh, we need a new VP of this. Let's go hire, two month cycle, hired. Six months in, oh shit, I should have spent more time on it. Don't do that. By the way, we've all done it, but. Um, when there's great leaders, get out of their way. <laughs> when, you, when you have the conviction as a founder that you have built a team that has the right level of seniority and they're doing, the, they can be independent, get out of their way. Empower them to do more and faster. Remove the roadblocks. Don't be micromanaging them every day. Founders, micromanagers, anybody? Oh. Not gonna go there now. And then accept sooner the fact that you cannot uh, anymore know it all. Um, it never gets any easier. It gets only harder. We just get a little bit more used to it. But it's not gonna get any easier. Um, and then my Cheesy wrap-up. Never stop rolling up sleeves, showing them how it's done, and getting your hands dirty. Thank you. <laughs> Says three minutes. If any if folks have questions, I'm told y'all go to the microphone and talk there. Hey, nice to meet you. Um, I have. A, it seems like you are growing, especially internationally, through the VAR channel. So can you come, uh, talk closer to the microphone? Thank you. It seems like you are growing, especially international, when you first went to the US through the VAR channel. Yes. Does that still play a big part of your sales strategy today? How are you thinking about VARs? Yeah, business is more than 80% um, direct. So I would say um, over time, we switched from heavy channel to heavy direct. Channel for us was to break into certain territories where we didn't have any presence. The philosophy was break into territory, and once you are in there, we switch primarily to a direct model. Now, in certain territories, Europe and APAC in particular, we have channel and direct work very well together. In North America, I would say we get outside of our OEM business, which is a separate business line, um, it's, it's very much mostly direct. Was it because of the economics or what was the reason why you think? Um, I think it's a little bit about a few different things, but one is kind of the dynamics of our industry um, in our space. Um, the, other, the other thing is, you know, in general, it's when you go in the enterprise space, it's, it's a lot harder to have uh, third parties that can follow the, your entire cycle of marketing, selling, implementing, supporting in the way that you would. So we actually leverage channel a lot for services, right? The services side, the implementation side, we, we use partners a ton, but in the commercialization aspect, it's, it's mostly direct. Thank you for the question. Um, firstly, I would like to congratulate you on an amazing success story. And Thank you. I think you and your entire team demonstrated tremendous grit over the last decade or so in building this great company. Thank right? you. Um, I have actually you know, a follow-up question uh, on the same channel strategy. Yes. Uh, right? Because uh, we do see that it's a capital efficient way of being able to kind of you know, come to a revenue position without diluting the whole equity base, right? So from that perspective, I'd like your recommendations on, uh, you know, essentially what are the best ways to go up 
go about building and managing the VAR slash channel practice and any, you know, and, and uh, maybe, you know, a couple of recommendations on large channel partners to go with. Yeah, sorry, the first question, is it on channel or talent? I'm, I no, no, it's, it's primarily our own channel. Okay, cool. Yeah. So uh, I would say I could speak it to this a lot. One, one key fact is I think um, working with a channel, working successfully with a channel partner is not that dissimilar than working successfully with a customer. What do we do to attract the right customers? We profile them. We say, okay, ideal customer profile. We draw the attributes, industry, stage, uh, uh, problem they're trying to solve, all of that. When you're trying to build a channel network, you have to archetype the type of partners that are right for you and the ones that are not right for you. And the one thing that people don't, in my opinion, don't think about hard enough is what is in it, not just for us. For us, that's easy. For them, you gotta be thinking about how are they gonna be making money and succeeding and what is gonna motivate them to drive the type of business that we want. And so it's, it's a little bit of about, you know, a real whiteboarding exercise. Of, of analyzing, okay, what is the, the market and the space and the type of partners that we want? Are they resellers? Are they bars? Do they actually, are they big companies? Are they smaller? Are they a size? You know, there's a thousand questions you gotta ask yourself, but then eventually you gotta come down with a, um, a belief of one or two categories and then go attract those, test, see if your ideas were the right ones, and if, if they were not, pivot quick. But if they were, then attract those and not all over the place. Oftentimes I see channel strategies not working really well because when you look at the channel base, they're all over the place. One company is like 10 employees, another one is 300, and they all think differently, and it's really hard to scale. So I guess net-net is profile your channel, have a philosophy of what you want them to do, how they're gonna make a lot of money, make you successful, and um, you know, iterate and improve. Thank you very much. Uh, would you be open to a LinkedIn Connect? Absolutely. Thank you. Oh my gosh. Yes. I don't, I don't charge for it. I promise. <laughs> All right. Well, um, it was great being here. Thank you, Saster team. You're awesome. And uh, thank you for sitting in my session. And uh, yeah, I don't, I don't have an auto charge on LinkedIn, so please connect. And if you have any question, um, I'd love to engage later on. All right. Thank you.